Good afternoon. It's good to see so many nice faces here. Of course, I'm sure you would have much rather have had uh, Don McCullen here at the podium speaking to you, and I do understand that uh, because he is um, quite uh, an extraordinary person, uh, human being. Uh, we will see him a little bit uh, through throughout the presentation. I tried to do something, and I hope it will work. I'm not uh, a great expert in the new technology, but with the help of very qualified people, uh, it might happen on a few occasions. You'll see and you'll hear uh, Don McCullen, whom we uh, photographed, filmed, and interviewed uh, for a book project, a catalog, actually. Actually, the catalog that you can find here um, at the uh, State Library. The State Library that I would like to thank, and, and then before I forget uh, doing that at the end, uh, since there'll be so many questions I'll have to answer, but I do want to uh, congratulate the um, State Library for hosting such a show. I've taken this show to I think about 15 venues around the world over the last that many or more years. It's a big show. It's a very powerful show. I don't know how many of you have seen it already. Maybe you're just here to listen first and go and see it afterwards. It's worth seeing. And I've seen it so many times, and the images I will be showing you I've seen so many times. And for some reason, I rediscover them every time because the message is very powerful and the message is very present, it's very contemporary. Uh, Don McCullen uh, started, uh, was born at 1935, therefore before World War II, and that takes us back almost 80 years. Um, he's, he is uh, very much alive and working still. He takes photographs, not that much of conflict anymore, though a couple of years ago he did something that most people thought was rather foolish, which was to go to Syria. And at the age of uh, 76, uh, um, you know, it was maybe not the wisest thing to do, but he, he felt compelled to do that. He partially out of despair because he had hoped that his photographs would somewhat uh, change uh, our perception of the world and make us understand how terrible and futile uh, war is, but um, he came to the realization that he didn't change much, and he wanted to see what wars were like today, and it was that they're just as bad and maybe even worse. Uh, his experience in Syria was um, something quite harrowing for him. Now this is this is Don McCullen, so you get an idea of what he looks like today, but the interesting thing is to have an idea of what he looked like 80 years ago, and here he is on the right-hand side. Um, I like particularly, he is reflected in the mirror in the back, and I'll tell you the story about how he came to photograph the Beatles here, Paul McCartney. Uh, in 1968, just a few months after coming back from Vietnam, uh, where he had uh, covered the Battle of Hue uh, during the Tet Offensive, and that was really the turning point in the war. You notice that he is wearing military fatigues in, these, in this photograph. Here he is uh, photographed in Biafra, Nigeria, by his friend, uh, colleague, uh, Gilles Caron, French photographer, who uh, shortly um, after, would disappear in Cambodia. Don McCullen is somebody who is very fit and very energetic, even today. He, he grew up in a very derelict uh, area of London and um, is a totally self-taught person, never went to school. He hung out with his buddies who for the most part, were members of gangs and got into trouble. They were fighting all the time. They were um, engaged in situations that um, he does not approve of, certainly today. And he recognizes that the camera probably saved him from you know, 
a life similar to that of his friends, many of whom either died or ended up in prison or became alcoholic and uh, have had rather a miserable life. Berlin, 1961. He's in Paris on his honeymoon with his uh, wife, um, of course, um, and the headlines in the newspapers that indicate there's a crisis, something happening in Berlin. So he tells his wife, Christine, that he wants to go to Berlin, interrupt the honeymoon and go to Berlin. That is a pretty, de no, it's a pretty daring thing to do. And, and she agreed to it. So he gathered the 500 pounds he had in his savings account and bought a ticket and went to Berlin with just on his own. Why? Because he was intrigued, he was curious, he wanted to understand what the hell was going on over there. So he goes to Berlin and a wall has been erected between East and West Berlin, between communist uh, Berlin and capitalist uh, Berlin. Um, you know, the, the city was divided after World War II. And that is his first conflict. The first conflict, the first international story he uh, is engaged in. Uh, and it is a conflict, it's a Cold War. But Cold Wars can turn into hot wars that we do know. And actually many of the wars that would take place after um, developed in the context of the Cold War. He came back to London with photographs that he shot on a square format film. And um, these photographs gave him recognition. He, uh, newspapers that had turned him down initially when he asked them for support to go to uh, Berlin, published his pictures and recognition came and awards came and his career started. He thought it was quite adventurous. Um, alive at, at first, but then very quickly realized that war was a serious uh, affair, a serious business. And so this gets him started, and he would not stop for 25 years, basically, going around the world where um, wars are developing, where rather terrible things are happening. And it became a mission, it became his his reason of being a photographer. And he realized and he thought that the camera would be a very important, a very instrumental tool in terms of making people aware of situations and hopefully affecting public opinion and therefore maybe having some impact on decisions that were made by leaders around the world. At the same time, he was really concerned with issues in England, social issues. I mean, England in the decades following World War II was not necessarily always the happiest place. There were tremendous uh, economic discrepancies and social discrepancies. And Don, who came from a very poor background, was naturally sort of inclined to observe. He could have tried to escape and meet and, and need a very, um, more peasant life, which uh, photography could allow him to do. Instead, he accepted to go to Cyprus, for, which are some of the images that we're seeing here, which was um, in, caught in a civil war between a Turkish minority and a, uh, a Greek um, majority, and he saw scenes that really profoundly perturbed him and shaped his life. He wrote a book, um, oh, there's an exhibition that exists uh, that was shown in England and a book catalog that went along with it called Shaped by War. And that is really the story of his life. This image taken in Cyprus won him the World Press Photo Premier Award, which is a very prestigious award within the photojournalism uh, community and it, it did give him uh, major recognition. I, I would be stupid to deny that there, there wasn't a moral issue. And this issue has to be the most important issue. Why are you there? Is it because you want to become a famous photographer? Is it because you want to become a... Um, uh, the, uh, I was there as a photographer and I wanted to go away 
with this picture that said, you know, help me, yes, yes. understand me, understand this human being, and, and what, what have they done to me? This is my, 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 my whole way of trying to get this image. That was what I was after. And um, you can only do that by, by gently approaching the victims, if we can use this terminology, in a dignified way. And also, strangely enough, in some of my photographs, I even believe that you will see dignity in their suffering. Yes, yes. That's my, that was my ultimate aim, was to show the, the shameful destruction of human beings who had committed no offence, no crimes. I think that expresses the basis of his entire philosophy, and I thought it would be good to show you some sequences. So, out to Cyprus, he'll be in Congo, where horrific things are happening. Once again, a civil war of sorts, the, the, you know, in the footsteps of the decolonization of Africa. Um, and. Um, Everything becomes very painful for him, but by the same token, he knows that he has to be there. That, and what I said earlier, he's a man with a mission, and uh, the one to, who wants, whether it's in the Congo, after Cyprus, or in the Middle East, uh, here uh, during the 1967 war and other conflicts afterwards, he wants to not just be a witness, but speak about the people who are uh, the victims of these situations, usually civilians, mostly uh, children, elder, older people, women. And Vietnam would be uh, the same situation. Don would go 18 times to Vietnam over a 10, 11 year period for two, three weeks at a time. He had an unusual way of working because he was a freelance photographer with a contract with uh, the Sunday Times magazine, but he would never send his film back. He would shoot, stay as long as he felt it was necessary for him to be there to see what was going on. He would come back, process his own film, um, edit the pictures, print the pictures and only when everything was together would he go and see his editors at the Sunday Times. And in those days it could take several weeks before a story would be published. So many of his stories, like these from Vietnam, were actually published quite a few weeks after the events took place. He never was a photographer of record. He's not like M newspapers, newspaper photographers, or Y service uh, newspapers were people who had to cover the events as they were developing on a day to day basis and report about them. That was not what he was there to do. He was there to, to do what he felt was important. That's what he chose uh, to do and produce images that would have a lasting impact, such as this very famous photograph of the shell-shocked marine, and shell-shocked really means that uh, his, he has this stare that's amazing, which is the stare of uh, a post-traumatic stress syndrome in combat uh, situations. Um, an image that Phil Caputo, the American writer, considers the, one of the greatest, or maybe the greatest war picture, because it represents all wars. The ugly side, of course, of the conflict, um, is what uh, McCullen um, focuses on, but his interest is always, always in the victims of these conflicts, as he said in <coughs> the few words we just heard, those people who are innocent. And what he has this extraordinary ability to establish a very powerful, direct, eye contact with many of the people he photographs. He looks at them straight in the eyes and he has, um, he says a 
sort of conversation with them just because he doesn't speak, of course, the language of most of the people he's photographing, and the situation is not, <coughs> of course, um, conducive to having a conversation. But this connection is something that is very powerful that you find throughout um, uh, Don McKean's work, such as in with this Vietnamese um, man who just witnessed, as, as Don did, some terrible situations. Strange enough, I was telling you earlier that in uh, 1988, when he comes back from Vietnam, the Beatles ask, because he had become rather famous, not that he was seeking fame, but the Beatles ask him to photograph them. And he took pictures that he never wanted to publish. It took a long time to convince them to be published, and even a book was even done that is on sale here at the library that he doesn't like, and he doesn't like that book he doesn't at all. But he produced a very somber um, image of the Beatles. It's so different than anything we have ever seen, which means that he is able always, he has this um, ability to put something more in situations than most photographers would. Biafra was a very important uh, moment. Biafra was the southeast um, uh, province of uh, Nigeria that was seceding from the Federation, and the terrible, terrible conflict took place there, and uh, that generated a, a, a tremendous famine also that uh, killed possibly a million people or so, nobody quite knows. And uh, Don went to Biafra, not once, but twice, but three times over that period of time, and produced um, a series of portraits, if you will, of uh, people he encountered. This young woman, Patience, who is only 16 years old, and others. And that has left in Don a very deep scar and he speaks about it. Today he's haunted by these images. Don prints his images in his little lab, a shack in the garden of his house in Somerset, and he's all by himself, and he's there, and he listens to music and makes very few prints that are very slow in his processing, but it allows him to relive these moments continuously. He, 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 because he prints even today, and it, which is one of the reasons he is not in Australia, because he'd rather be in uh, his uh, darkroom printing than being on an airplane uh, for 70 hours uh, both ways if or you, something like this. If you, if you were in my position many years ago, I went into a, a camp in Africa and there were 800 dying women, children young children, girls, young boys, girls, children as, as old as two years of age. Yeah, right. Yes, dropping dead in front of me, dying in front of me, looking at me with the last of the, of the day, that day they would see in their lives, thinking I was bringing some salvation because I'm a white man coming to the... They thought maybe when the white man... <laughs> yeah, they thought I was some, some, some aid person if they, you know, they knew the white people brought the aid and the medicine. What did I bring them? A Nikon camera around my neck. I brought nothing. And they looked at me, 800 eyes were looking at me. And um, this is the, this is the, those are the bad, bad days of my life that will never go away. Amen. They will never be eradicated. So, you know, I should be really happy. I should be a fantastically free and happy man. But for all of my success in photography, I am pulling behind me the chains that you would find on of, an, of a Napoleonic prisoner. Yeah. I, I am not free. That's a pretty uh, powerful statement. I, I'm pleased we did film him and I'm able to show this to you because there's no way anybody could say it better than he does. Um, 
speaks in a very simple, direct, and very clear, and very thoughtful way. He has thought about everything. Cambodia, Northern Ireland, and every other major conflict that uh, took place during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and to the 90s, he would go to. It was no longer an adventure. It was, as I said earlier, the sense of mission. This, he had to be there, he had to, even if the photographs were not being published in the end, he went there. Now, I, in the early days, I remember, I met him 42, 43 years ago, 44 years ago, actually, and interviewed him um, uh, 43 years ago, exactly. And in that interview, he said to me very, very strongly, these are images from Northern Ireland. You notice the, the two women in the doorways over there when this charge is taking place? That's uh, one of his very famous photographs. But he told me then at a question I was asking that he felt that his images were meant to be in publications, in magazines, in newspapers, not on the walls of galleries or museums. That he was, I'm not an artist, he would say. My pictures have no room in on the walls of museums. Well, today, that is where you see his photographs. And he has, of course, changed opinion completely in that regard. But for the same reason, he does want even today his images to be seen because he also feels that what he photographed 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago is relevant to what is happening in our world today. Bangladesh was one of these, uh, at the time of the War of Independence, 1971, after the military invasion by East, uh, West Pakistan into East Pakistan that became Bangladesh, um, uh, millions of people were displaced and ended up in camps along the border with India. And the cholera, uh, cholera epidemic uh, uh, developed uh, very rapidly and Don, of course, rushed over again because, once again, this conflict was more about the civilians, the victims of the conflict, than about territory and military uh, forces. That's not what he was interested in. He was interested in the civilians. The picture of the family was disgusting, really. I was a father at the time. I found that image one of the most disturbing images I ever had to press that button to, to acquire. You know, Earlier when we talked about hiding behind the camera and how I denied you cannot hide behind a Nikon camera uh, emotionally in, in reality. But believe me, the day I took that picture, I would have given the world, you know, for that camera to be even bigger so that I could have hidden behind it. I was never more ashamed of being a human being and I was struggling not to cry because I saw that woman prior to death, foaming at the mouth in, in this hospital, which wasn't a hospital, it was a flooded schoolhouse, where there are children beating their faces, throwing themselves on the floor, um, and it was all I could do not to collapse. You know? And so um, it was the kind of day that, um, even if I talk to you now about it, I can feel the the welling up of, of emotion and it's hard for me to be in control of my conversation. So it was right I felt like that and I feel like this. How would I have emotionally transferred that image onto film and into this conversation if it hadn't affected me? It's right that it affects you. Otherwise my pictures are going to be sanitized and they're going to be without feeling and that would be contemptible. He photographed Mother Teresa, actually, in Calcutta, shortly because he, that was very close by. But between these conflicts, England was a place he would visit north and south, east and west, and, uh, and particularly um, everything related to poverty, to homelessness, etc., which profoundly perturbed him. Of course, he had 
an element of reference, which is what he had seen in other parts of the world. So he was um, looking in his backyard to try and understand if things were all that different always, and if there were not issues like these homeless in London, and we're speaking of you know the mid-70s here. It's not that long ago, after all. Um, the way he establishes this connection, once again, this, this gaze, this way people look at him, and he looks at them deeply in, in their eyes. The, the, the exchange of these, their gazes is something that really defines um, Don's uh, portraiture, if you will. Many of these stories he did on England were actually published in the London Sunday Times, and they were equally per perturbing for the readers, as were the images of all the conflicts he gathered. And that is what many people remember um, him for, which was what he wanted to be remembered for also is to disturb people um, uh, on Sunday mornings as they're having breakfast and bring them some of the reality. Not that he was trying to say that that's the only thing that was happening in the world, but trying to remind people that this exists and uh, should not be discarded and rejected, etc. But as you'll notice looking at these photographs, he goes back to the places he's been to before. Here he's in Cambodia, Vietnam, Cambodia, that whole conflict that is you know, ongoing that would last about 20 years altogether. Well, 12 years, uh, the American War, because there was the French War before that, the Indochina War. Um, and he's, of course, uh, back to the Middle East. Uh, he's after Cambodia. Um, he could, no, no, this was in 1976, um, he went back to the Middle East in 2012, uh, to Syria, and came to recognize that things had not changed all that much and not improved. And the events that are happening lately would tend to prove it even more, if needed. The Battle of the Quarantine, uh, where um, the Palestinian refugee camps were um, uh, taken over by uh, Christian phalangists, and, um, and terrible things happened in the streets of Beirut at that time. A dead body on the ground and uh, chanting happy, happy uh, people because the enemy has been destroyed, uh, individuals, it's... Um, so, <coughs> he's in the Middle East in the 70s, he's back there in 1982 of the, the Israeli invas invasion of Lebanon, it's an ongoing situation, but back in England, he will pursue his own investigations in, in the northern part of England in particular, and the poverty that still exists. And we're speaking again of the 80s, uh, 30, not 30 years after the end of World War II. Pictures would be uh, published always, almost always, because he was working with a very remarkable um, editor and picture editor by the name of Michael Rand, who um, believed deeply in the significance, the importance of the work, and realized that uh, Don's work was not only meant to be um, shown on the pages of uh, the, the magazine, but were also meant to be published in the book form and encouraged on to even 
present his work in on the walls of galleries and um, museums, which is what he started to do at that point, realizing that this was a very effective way of reaching people and bringing uh, his message to, um, to them in England. But Don gained a tremendous international reputation. His work was published in Europe, in France, in Italy, in Germany. The material was syndicated, resold, partially by the London Sunday Times and also by Magnum Agency, which uh, distributed him for a while and in the United States also. But he never thought of his work as being art. You know, there is a danger when you take these photographs that you're turning them into works of art. That's what you have to be careful of. Just because I try to compose, I try to balance and compose my, uh, you know, I'm, when I'm taking these pictures, I'm, you know, deliberately saying, you know, if I do this right, we can hold people's attention. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise it becomes another atrocity picture. You, you know, I was doing all this discipline with my, my eye because I wanted you to look at these pictures, not to reject them out of hand. So where do you stop this creative side of you? Because otherwise people are going to say, is this art he's trying to give us here? You know, But it isn't in my case, I've never considered. This is, this is my indulgence of a... Uh, uh, Compassion. Yeah, this is my indulgence. You can do it with a sparrow, but you cannot do it with human beings. And he had deep interest in art and in artists. Uh, he even photographed uh, some rather renowned artists such as Francis Bacon here, who, like Don, had a pretty somber vision of the world. Um, but an artist, no. A discoverer, yes. A traveler, yes. Wanting to know what the world out there was about, took him to other places which were on the borderline of conflict, like uh, Indonesia and Iran Jaya and uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, and he would take advantage of these trips to find some measure of peace in developing what he called, besides his images uh, of peace, which are the landscapes. Landscapes in India, landscapes in England, um, landscapes which um, um, brought him uh, a different dimension, uh, an understanding of the world. He would visit the banks of the Ganges River in India many, many times over 20 years. He would attend some of the big spiritual festivals that take place. And yet, even in these situations, his eye would also reach out always to those who were discriminated against, were um, underprivileged in many ways, not, so, not only socially and economically, but um, because of, um, you know, physical handicaps. Uh, here you can see a beggar on the streets uh, near the Ganges or a leper here. He is constantly, constantly um, in search of uh, people who um, have no voice and are discarded by society. When the Iraq War would go uh, would take place in um, 19, the early 1991, um, he would go to Kurdistan. He wanted to be in Iraq. He wanted to be the witness of that war. Uh, it was very difficult. The media had a rough time getting access. Um, he was able to get into Iraq via Kurdistan, and um, but was not successful in going much further. Um, so he came back to England and went back into his um, 
So dark mood and um, devo developing these incredible and beautiful at the same time landscapes of his of Somerset, which is not where he was born, but where he lives today. And um, he calls them images of peace, um, I, which always um, astonishes me because there's something very deeply tragic and very um, powerful about these images and very disturbing these clouds, and he explains, and there's a quote in the exhibition where he says he will never sh take a photograph on a sunny day. It's not only a matter of aesthetics, it's a matter of his inner feelings. I think he is, you know, like many uh, people, whether under the un uniform or journalists who have been the witness to many um, conflicts, he is deeply affected by it, not only spiritually, but um, psychologically. Uh, and this is his way of overcoming uh, this uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome that uh, is so often spoken about today. Landscapes and still lives, he, he tries other things. And for a period of about 10 years, that is what he will primarily be doing with his photography until until he realized that there were other wars that were taking place that were equally devastating and he was reading about the um, AIDS epidemic in uh, in southern Africa and he felt compelled to go and cover what he called was this new form of uh, warfare, the, the, the uh, this millions of people being disseminated and um, in, in a country where as uh, it was possible to, to stop such uh, or to slow down and to eliminate such uh, a situation um, with, uh, of course, through education, with better knowledge, with bringing in uh, medicine that, of course, people could not afford. So England and Somerset, he spends much time in, and one day, one day decides that he should go back to Africa, which he did, and spent uh, quite a few months over a, a period of five or six years in um, the late 90s and early 20s, visiting South Africa, Zambia, Botswana, and later on the northeastern part of, uh, of Africa, the continent, Ethiopia, and Sudan. And these are part of his most uh, recent uh, photographs. Um, most of the images I'm showing here are in the exhibition, not all of them, but most are. And you should, of course, look at them because they do provide you with a very different perspective than the images you see on the screen, knowing that every single image, but for two of them, that are in the show were printed by him over those 50 years. He is one of the very rare photographers or photojournalists who does his own printing. It is something that is very personal. He will not allow others to touch his negatives and interpret uh, his images. And that in itself is a very powerful and a very strong statement. These images are from Ethiopia, where he noticed, you know, there's this long tradition among the herdsmen to have these tournaments of s stick fights, um, and but the sticks are gradually being replaced today by AK AK-47s from the different 
wars in the that have been taking place in um, on the continent and in the mid in um, the Middle East, and uh, these AK-47s are bought for anywhere between five and fifty dollars a piece, and it is transforming completely transforming the landscape, uh, social and uh, tribal and uh, and economic uh, landscape also, uh, AK-47s are rather devastating. But then back to England and to another England that he never photographed really in over all these years, which was you know, the upper class and the upper middle class of England, uh, which he decided that he maybe should pay attention to also. And in uh, the early uh, 2000, uh, he spent time between Africa and England and two very different, uh, sort of been becoming very schizophrenic in a way, which he always was. But one of his great passions has always been archaeology and uh, in that tradition of 19th century photography. And he embarked on a project that took him several years to do, which is to photograph the traces of the Roman Empire around the basin, the Mediterranean basin. Now, it's not born out of nothing. It's born out of the sense that, well, and the knowledge that uh, the Roman Empire was built on military power, on war, all over uh, the Middle East and all over Europe and North Africa, and uh, that this empire has disappeared. But he thought there's a lesson to be learned from that, and he went on to this trip that took him to Morocco, to Turkey, to Syria, and to England, this image of the Hadrian War. Um, and didn't take him to Sudan, but he developed a similar interest for the um, pyramids of the black pharaohs of Sudan. So his a very eclectic mind also has deep interest in many uh, topics. He is a totally self-taught self person. This last image is a landscape, but it's a landscape of something that does remind us of war, the Battle of La Somme, which was a devastating battle in World War I uh, that he went over as for, for sort of pilgrimage, if you will, and um, photograph in this uh, landscape uh, style. That's it in terms of the photographs I will be showing you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.